information to help you run your business better and improve your marketing campaigns. My name is Hank Hoffmeyer, and thank you for joining me on Hank's Marketing and Business Tips. Today I'm with Barbara Hemphill. She's with Barbara Hemphill LLC. Similar naming nomenclature like me, Hank Hoffmeyer LLC. Seems to be pretty popular these days. I'm going to let Barbara tell us what she does because I feel like she can provide so much value today in regards to productivity. Barbara, welcome and tell us a little bit about your LLC and as well as the other entity you have. Right. Thanks, Hank. I appreciate the opportunity. Research shows that the average employee spends 19% of their time looking for what they need to do their work. So if you take a company with 20 employees at an average wage of $15 an hour, that represents a lost productivity cost of $115,000 per year, every year. And research shows that 80% of what we keep, we never use. And the more we keep, the less we use which means that the reason that people are spending all this time looking for what they need is clutter. So my passion is helping people eliminate the physical and digital clutter in their life, which I've discovered is actually created. It's a symptom of emotional and spiritual clutter. Hmm. So that's what I like to do. I like to help people eliminate the clutter that comes on their computer desktops, in their email, in their database, uh, in their offices, in their storage rooms, offsite storage, all the places that we keep stuff that we really don't need or use. Right, and that's a common problem, not even just with business owners, with anyone in general. And I struggle with it and I try to do my best to stay organized, but with all of these digital tools and sharing tools like Dropbox, Box, OneDrive, you name it, Files, you know, digital can be spread everywhere and paperwork can be put anywhere, can be forgotten about, it can be uh, put away, it can be put in a drawer and forgot about. And then all of a sudden you have this mountain of data or, or paperwork that you need to look through when you need to find something. And that stat was very impressive. And uh, even though I try to stay organized, there's times when I need to find something and I can't. My problem is with digital assets, I may need it, so therefore I'm going to keep it. But I try to keep it in a folder, but then again, sometimes you forget which folder is nested in what folder. And I think these tools find it make it very hard to search, right? Because sometimes you forget the name of it. There needs to be a better way. Um, so what are some top tips that you have when it comes to productivity, both for digital and for what I want to call, I guess, uh, non-digital? All right. Well, the premise of my business, I've been doing this now almost 40 years, and the premise of my business is four words. Clutter is postponed decisions. So people often ask me the question, what should I do about something? So they might be talking about their email or organizing their digital files or what to do with paper or whatever. And I always say, that's the wrong question. The question is, what will you do? Organization in and of itself has no value. And in fact, almost all of us know somebody who spends all their time getting organized, but they don't really have anything to show for it. Um, So we want to have organization be something that you use in order to get where you want to go, where you want to accomplish something. So I'm a big proponent of systems. I've never liked acronyms very much, but one of my consultants in South Africa gave me a an acronym that I just love for system, saving you space, time, energy, and money. Hmm. Isn't that awesome? I like that. I mean, it's just amazing because you think about it, every time there's something that you have to do repeatedly, whatever it is, whether it's post on social media or pay your bills or do your taxes or uh, have a discussion with a colleague or spend time with somebody in your life that you care about, that you really want to, any relationship, if you want to nurture a relationship, you have to have a system for doing that. And so that's what I love to do is help people find systems. And so the way I do that is through a five-step process that we call the productive environment process. Let me just back up and say, uh, one of my companies is called Productive Environment Institute. And I define a productive environment as an intentional setting 
in which everyone can accomplish their work and enjoy their lives. Your environment's everywhere. Your environment is your office, it's your desk, it's your computer desk, it's your car, it's your closet, it's your, it's your kitchen, uh, it's your, even your brain. If your brain is full of, oh, I shouldn't have done that, that'll never work, that's not an environment that's going to help you accomplish what you do. Right. So we have a five-step process that we use to solve any kind of problem that we call the productive environment process. So those five steps are, number one, state your vision. So when someone says, I need your help, I immediately say, to do what? If you're successful organizing whatever it is we're talking about, whether it's your office or your email or whatever it is, what would that look like? So that's step number one. Step number two, identify your obstacles. What have you tried in the past that didn't work? What are you afraid of? What, why are you procrastinating, et cetera? Step number three is identify your resources. So it's like, okay, what resources do you have that can help you? So like if somebody wants their email organized, the first thing I say is, okay, what email server are you using? Because that's going to make a difference in how, in how we do about it. Or who can help you? I mean, all of us have people, and I think we often don't take advantage of that. There are people who are good at what we do that love to do it, and it comes naturally. And if we would just ask, they would help and they don't even always charge for it because for them it's so easy. They don't, you know, it's like, Oh, I can do that. Right. So it feels your- good to pay it forward sometimes. And, and I have this term GTY greater than yourself. And it's a, a wonderful book that I read and it's by Steve Farber, if anyone wants to look it up, but it talks about mentoring up and mentoring down. And I, I took that to heart and I found some accountability partners, you know, in regards to business that talk to me and say, Hey, what are your goals? And where are you with this goal? You know, whatever it is. And we talk at least weekly and, and yeah, having somebody help you and remind you and offer you ways to do things. Maybe they made a mistake that they can help you avoid and you can tremendously do better with a project because you're going to avoid a mistake. Why not use those resources? And I think that, that was a, a great you know, mention right there. Well, one of my principles is together we are better. And that's really what you're, you know, that's really what you're saying. And research shows that you are 76% more likely to accomplish a task if you have an accountability partner. So that's another reason. That's powerful because that's, you know, basically the difference between doing it and not doing it. I think once you get over to 50% mark, you're more into the positive land, right? Where uh, anything below that, like you were mentioning earlier, you're going to have doubts or you're going to you think of obstacles rather than, hey, I need more time to do this, which is a different problem. You, you want to avoid the negativity. Just say, I need to get this done. and I need to get it done by X. You know, maybe you don't get it done on a time and all that, but at least you're trying and you're getting there, right? Well, let's go back to the five steps that we were talking about because it addresses this very issue and we'll get, it's five steps and we get right. to the fifth step. So step number one, just to review, step number one is state your vision. Okay. So what's required, what will happen, what will be different. Number two, identify your obstacles. Number three, uh, commit your resources. Number four, design and execute your plan. So it's like, okay, in order to reach this vision, overcoming these obstacles with these resources, Here's my plan. So you do your plan for whatever it is, writing your blog, cleaning up your database, whatever it is. And then step five is actually the most important. And it's the one where people most often uh, fall off the wagon, so to speak, and that's sustain your success. So what happens so often is we have a plan and we try it and then it doesn't work. And instead of analyzing why it didn't work, we just stop. And so the thing that I love about those five steps, notice the common word in all five steps is your, it's all about you. And I see organizing and productivity as an art form it, and everybody does it differently. And for every person who does it one way, there's somebody else who does it exactly the opposite and they are equally successful. So it's a matter of figuring out what's really going to work for you, which is what makes this fun for me after 40 years, because God didn't create any two people the same. So it's always a matter of figuring out, okay, what's, you know, what's really going to work for you. Right. I think you really need to go through all those steps and, and be consistent. And one phrase I've learned from speaking is practice makes, and I'm letting it sit there for a second because I want my audience to fill in the blank. You're going to think perfect, but really practice makes permanent. Therefore, if you go through those steps, each time you have a project or a need, you're going to go through it better each time and it won't feel like it's daunting and it'll feel like a process at some point and those steps can really help. 
for me, maybe you have an idea on this, I don't know. If I write it down, or if I have a paper planner, I forget to write it down, right? And they, therefore it will not become a goal or a task that I need to do, and I forgot about it. On a digital side, I really can go in and put it onto a list, but then I forget to go back to look at the list. So on the digital side, I forget to go look at the list. On the written side, I forget to write it down. What I'm trying to do is do some practice to make permanent to only use one and make sure I'm going to do what I need to do on each one of the, either one of those. And I, I haven't chosen yet. Well, Hank, you bring up something that is a huge issue in the world. Um, and it's amazing how many people haven't really figured it out yet. And partly because it changes. I had, was having discussion with a, a consulting uh, duo. It's a couple that works with very large companies and, and uh, major executives. And she was saying that she was amazed at how many times she would go into work with an executive, a large company who was feeling all stressed and just discombobulated. And she would say, how do you keep your to-do list? And he or she would say, in my head. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, wow, that's, you know, that's just amazing. And a calendar or planner or whatever you call it, I have honestly never met anyone that is comfortable with their, I mean, none of us are perfect, right? But some people are more comfortable with their productivity than others. And I've never met anyone who was comfortable with their productivity that hadn't really resolved the issue of paper versus digital calendar, for example. And one of my principles is you can have anything you want, but not everything. It's always trade-offs. Mm -hmm. So for decades, literally over two decades, I used a paper planner called a planner pad. It's, a, it's very unique. You can only get it online. Um, I've had many of my clients who said, oh, man, I've been looking this, for this for years. And, you know, everything old is new again. Now, a lot of people that went to digital are now coming back around and going back to paper. I solved it. And this is where you need a system. This is a perfect example of there's so many tools and so many different ways you can do it. You have to come up with your system and to your point, Hank, make it a habit. That's exactly right. So I resolved it by using both. I use a planner pad, a paper planner pad, uh, but my calendar, my electronic calendar is the most reliable in terms of appointments because I share it with other people as I did with you. And so I, it must be, you know, really perfect in order to share it. Right. But in terms of writing down to do's and all that thing, those things I use it in a planner in the planner pad. So it's really a matter of coming up with your system. And that's one of the things we do. I often do what I call laser coaching, which is just a 30 minute telephone conversation with somebody that says, okay, let's use these five steps that I just described and let's figure out what would be the best calendar system for you because of your personality and the way you like to do things. Nice. Well, I did. And I went out and bought some of those planner pages, went to Target, bought calendars. I couldn't find exactly what I was looking for. What I wanted was a bunch of different elements from different planners. What I ended up doing was developing my own template where at the top it has things I'm grateful for, things I'm excited for, an affirmation message. Then I have the top five things that I need to get done that day. And then whether I exercise or not, and then I have little, um, uh, pictures of water cups and how many cups of water I drank. And then it says plan for tomorrow and then successes for today. I use that for a lot of the big project stuff I'm working on. Maybe some things I'll write down really quick, but otherwise I use uh, the, the tasks in either iOS or in the, the iOS notes app with the check marks uh, to go ahead and just say, these are little things I need to get done at some point. And then I go through those. I'm still working through my system, but my planner page is awesome. You know, everyone I've shared it with loves it. It's on my website. I'll link to it in the show notes in case anybody wants to see it and maybe have access to it. But like you said, I just need to really hone in on how I want that system to flow. And I think I'm getting to a point where it's starting to work, but I just need to remember every morning I need to fill out that paper. And then, you know, during the day, I need to go through my digital tasks a couple times. And one of the things like you, you mentioned every morning I need to fill it out. Sometimes it's the tiniest little things that can make a difference. For some people, they like to do it the night before so that when they get up in the morning, they've already got it done. Other people want to do it that morning. It doesn't have a right or a wrong. Again, it's a habit and it's like, where are you better? I'll give you a funny example of habits. It's, it's household related, but 
for years, because I was an organizing consultant, you know, I used to think that when I went to bed at night, my house should be reasonably in order. You know, the sink shouldn't have any dirty dishes in it and there shouldn't be any dirty clothes and stuff like that. And so at night before I would go to bed, I would try to clean up everything and I hated it. It made me feel like a martyr. I was tired. It was like, Oh, you know, whatever. And one night I just went to bed and I said, I'm forget it. I got up the next morning, put the coffee pot on. And while the coffee was brewing, I just went around and did those things. And it was, gosh, it was really easy. And I thought, this is amazing. The fact that I, that difference, you know, it's like I was refreshed and I, oh, I turned on music. That's the other thing. I would, I would turn on the coffee pot and I would turn on the music. And so while the music was on, I'd go around and pick up things. And suddenly it's not a problem anymore. Just changing it from doing it at night, doing it in the morning and at night. And I think often those kind of little things really make any difference. That's the reason that that step five, sustain your success is so important because everything that you say, think, or feel about whatever it is you're working on is one of those five things. It's either part of your vision, which might be changed. You might start out with this and then you might change it. It's an obstacle that you haven't overcome yet. It's a resource, either a resource that you lost or a resource that you need or something, or it's just part of the plan. Like what you're describing is as part of the plan. You're working on the plan. And then step five is that it's, it's something where I, I need to tweak it just a little bit. So everything that you say, think, or feel fits into one of those five steps. So it gives people a great way to hone what they're doing so they can accomplish their work and enjoy their lives. Right. I, I love that story. That, that was great. And it's almost like people, tend to plan either in the morning or at night. I'd say try both and see which one's more effective. Absolutely. Plan at night, just wait in the morning, it can hit the ground running. Me, I like to think about what I need to do the next day, but then what happens is at night when I'm sleeping, I come up with these great ideas, then in the morning I can quickly jot them down and then, and then I can have them become additional small tasks. And I don't know if you've read the book, Eat That Frog, but absolutely I that in my role here at Eye Contact, things come up, I need to eat the frog right then and there while it's warm on the plate, I guess is the phrase. <laughs> <laughs> because to me, clients are important. If they have a need or you know, a prospective client wants to come on board, I want to help them out as quickly as I can. And somebody will always tell me, are you the most efficient and most productive you can be? And I'll say no, but that's by design. It's because I want to make sure that everyone in that contact is successful as well as anyone who uses eye contact as their email marketing platform. They're my number one priority. I come next. I believe in organized chaos. My life is chaotic. My work is chaotic, but I keep it organized. Well, see, I, I would challenge you and say that you are the most productive because your, your personality and your job is such that putting your customer first is what you need to be doing in order to accomplish your work and enjoy your life. So I would say you are being the most productive. I would say doing it the other way would be self-centered, and I don't think that makes for good business practice. Well, well, thank you for backing me up on that. And, and you know, what I said earlier, it's, it's mostly a joke, but yeah, I feel like that is my role and that's what I do. Therefore, it's not an excuse that I'm not going to plan everything out by hour by hour and get it done at, in that particular time. But I make sure that, oh, this needs to be done by this day or this, this uh, time frame. Yeah, I'm going to get that done. And who's, and like you said, who's going to help me get that done? And I find the players that will help me. And sometimes it's here at I contact. Sometimes it's somebody in my network. Sometimes it's my wife. Well, I think, you know, one of the other things is sometimes there, if something's been on your list for a long time and you haven't gotten it done, um, then it's really time to do an analysis about why is this, you know, still here? Why am I procrastinating about this? And one of the questions, this, this started when um, I was, I've organized people's desks and they'll they'll have papers and they'll be reluctant to throw it away so the question i ask them is what's the worst thing that would happen if you didn't have it if you did put this in the shred or the recycle uh and it turned out you were wrong what would happen and then is that a price you're willing to pay it's not a moral issue it's just a decision well you can do the same thing with your to-do list so you can say okay i've been saying for two days or two weeks or two months or two years that i'm going to do this and i haven't done it so what's the worst possible thing that would happen if I didn't do it? And then you can decide, oh, well, you know, I can. So then you say, okay, I'm not willing to live with that, that circumstance, but then what could I do to make it easier to do? You know, mm -hmm. I was going to do it this way, 
So maybe I should try it this way. You know, like I was going to make a phone call. Maybe I could do an email or um, I was going to write. I mean, how many business owners do you know that that want to write books? I mean, research shows that 80 percent of the population. We're not talking about business owners, but population believes they have a book in them. Well, how many people actually get that done? Well, why? Because they're always looking at the big picture. So they're always looking at the big picture instead of saying, as somebody once said, if you wrote a page a day by the end of the year, you've had 365 pages. Now, obviously it's not a 365 page book, but it's a good place to start. And then you really can go to an editor or somebody like that. And guess what? You really can have a book. So it's- I just launched a book on January 15th. And the interesting thing is some people have come up to me when they see me or on Facebook, they'll tell me things that I should have done differently or why didn't I do this or why didn't I write on something else? And these are the type of people that probably will not read, ever write a book, but they're telling me how to do that. It's almost like I want to say, well, you haven't written a book. At least I did it and it's out in a while. <laughs> I'm not saying it's the most spectacular book they'll ever be, but I think it's beneficial and helpful to small business owners. And, and, and you know, that's another thing is I, I belong to a writer's group on Facebook. And like you said, there's so many people that feel like they have a book in them. And I see that passion there. And anyone that feels like that they want to write a book, just go ahead and do it. Get it out there. Um, find beta readers if you feel like you don't know if your content's good. People will give you feedback and use an editor and make sure that you do that because you want to come across as being professional. But if you have a book in you, find someone that's going to help you pull that out of you because the world needs to see it. Well, and, and the other thing is you could start by writing articles. I mean, a great way to test material is to write articles and see what happens. And I can say that uh, I wrote Taming the Paper Tiger was my first book, and that was back in 1988. Wow. And hands down, it was the best thing I ever did for my business because in our society, being an author has credibility. I'm sorry to say it doesn't even mean you have to have a good book. Right. <laughs> you just have to have a book. So if you think you have a book in you, then it really is important to get it out. And there are so many people who can help you. I think that's one of the other things. Uh, don't, um, don't think you have to do by yourself. And one of the other things that you want to ask, why are you writing a book? Like I just did some coaching this morning with a woman who's writing a book. And the only reason she wants to write it is she wants her son to have it. Oh, awesome. So that's a whole different approach than a business owner who says, I want my, my book to be my business card. So we can actually use that five-step process that I described for writing a book. So, okay, what's my vision for a book? What's it going to look like? What's it going to feel like? In fact, my most recent book, Less Clutter, More Life, came about. There's a wonderful story. I was talking to a friend of mine who actually became the artist that did the art of the book. The book is called Less Clutter, More Life. And we were having a conversation in 2014. And I said, oh, you know, I really need to write this book. And she said, well, why don't you write it? I have a condo in Carolina Beach. She said, just go down to the condo for a couple of weeks, sit down and write it. And I said, I can't. And she said, why? And I said, well, because this is a book that needs to touch emotions. And that means it needs to have artwork. And I, have, I don't have a clue. I don't have any idea. She asked me a very interesting question. She says, tell me, or made a statement. She said, tell me about the book. Oh, what do you mean? I said, well... The first thing that came out of my mind was it's six inches square and you can read it in less than an hour and it has more white space than print. And then she said, okay, look at the cover of the book. What do you feel? Hmm. And I said, peace. Then she said, okay, well, open up the cover. Now what do you feel? I said, hope. She said, okay, turn a page. Now what do you feel? I said, energy. And she stopped and she said, why don't you just fly out to, to Pasadena and we'll write this book together because she's a photographer. And that's exactly what I did. And I flew out to Pasadena and spent three days with her and I gave her the words and then she talked to me about them. So she actually kind of became an editor. Uh, and then she put the photographs in it and we made an agreement that I was in charge of the words. I was the keeper of the words and she was the keeper of the art but we wouldn't do anything that the other one didn't approve of. And so we published that book and it's just the joy of my life. And if I die tomorrow, it's like this book is literally what I am about. Less clutter, more life. How can we find your new book, Less Clutter, More Life? You can just go to my website, barbarahemphill.com 
and you'll find it there. You can get it on Amazon too. It's available on Amazon as well. Great. Yeah. Check it out if you get a chance. Uh, it's been great having this discussion. Like I say to almost everyone that comes on, I feel like I could go on for an hour, but what I've found is my listeners like to keep it a little bit shorter. Uh, therefore, I think you need to come back on at some point and we can go over some more items. And while you were talking, there are so many things I thought of that I can go over uh, in regards to being productive, but that probably will be another episode. Uh, if folks wanted to find you, what is the best way to connect with you on the internet? Um, well, I'm available on, uh, on Facebook and on LinkedIn and just go to my website, barbarahemphill.com is the simplest and then we'll send you anywhere that you want to go. Great. And again, can you recap those five steps? Uh, number one, state your vision. Number two, identify your obstacles. Number three, commit your resources. Number four, design and execute your plan. And number five, sustain your success. Awesome. And I'll put those in the show notes so people can refer to those. I think that's a great way to be productive this year. Uh, if you're just getting started, it's going to help you greatly. If you've been in business for a while, maybe it'll just help you become a little more efficient and you know, save, what is it, about $115,000 a year uh, per yes. employee? Um, that's a lot of money to save if you look at it as far as statistics or, or revenue-wise. And let me just close with one other thing that's it's something for people to think about. People always ask, you know, when they go to hire somebody to help them, one of the first questions they will ask is, how long is this going to take and how much is it going to cost? And I always reply to them, well, I really don't know because I don't know exactly what you need. And you would say the same thing to your prospects. You know, you, you, you have a ballpark, but you don't exactly know. But what I can tell you for sure is the longer you wait, the longer it will take and the more it will cost. That's right. I agree. If you want to listen to previous episodes, go to hankhoffmeyer.com slash Alexa. You can subscribe on multiple platforms. You can find them on my website. If you want to sign up for an eye contact account, there's a 30 day free trial. If you use the code HMBT, you'll get a $30 credit when you do start paying for your account, which I think is a, a pretty cool deal. It's something I worked up here at Eye Contact and just wanted to offer everyone here. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and we look forward to having Barbara on again. Thanks, Hank. Thank you.